All right, students, welcome to another exciting video in which I'm going to teach you in greater depth more about the wondrous world of molecular orbitals. So far, we've discussed a lot about atomic orbitals, that is S, P, Ds, and Fs. You guys might remember that from an earlier lecture. Now we're going to talk about molecular orbitals. Now, as I sort of hinted at in an earlier lecture, when individual atoms bond together, their individual atomic orbitals reshape and reconfigure to form new molecular orbitals. Molecular orbitals are different from atomic orbitals. They're not simple S, P, D, and F orbitals. Those are atomic orbitals. These, those are the orbitals that we see around individual atoms. When we talk about molecular orbitals, we're talking about uh, all of the orbitals that surround entire molecules that have multiple atoms in them. So molecular orbitals, the orbitals of molecules, can uh, have shapes that are much more complex than individual atomic orbitals, depending on their size and the nature of the molecules being formed. Once again, remember, please, that atomic orbitals, S, P, Ds, and Fs, are the orbitals possessed by individual atoms, while entire molecules possess things called molecular orbitals, which we'll now discuss. Now, this idea that individual atomic orbitals get together when they form molecules and bond together to, to form new molecular orbitals happens to be called molecular orbital theory. So every time two atomic orbitals get together and overlap to form a bond in a molecule, they actually form two different types of molecular orbitals, one called a bonding orbital and another called an anti-bonding orbital. This is illustrated in the following diagram showing the molecular orbitals for an H2 molecule. So when I have two individual atoms of hydrogen, they each have their atomic 1s orbitals that each possess one electron in it. As they get together, they now form a molecule of H2. And two new molecular orbitals form. One looks kind of like this pill here that uh, is called a bonding orbital. And then this other molecular orbital forms. It's called an anti-bonding orbital. Now, that seems kind of confusing and weird. For now, I just want you to sort of absorb it. I'll talk about it in more depth later on. So once you have your individual bonding and anti-bonding orbitals formed, Electrons then fill them up, starting at the bottom. The bonding orbital first, followed by the antibonding. As with atomic orbitals, each molecular orbital can hold up to two electrons. We can see that represented in this cute diagram here. What this represents is here on the left and on the right, we have individual hydrogen atoms and their individual 1s atomic orbitals. Each hydrogen atom, as a separate atom, brings one electron to the table. This guy here to the left, and this guy here to the right. Once they get together and overlap their two atomic orbitals, they now form two new orbitals. A bonding orbital that's represented by this box down here and an anti-bonding orbital up here. Because each of these individual hydrogen atoms brought one electron to the table, your final molecule of H2 has two total electrons in it. We put those here in the center, starting at the bottom first. You can hold up to two electrons per box. This bottom is the bonding orbital, and the top is the antibonding orbital. Thankfully, we only have two electrons in this whole system, so the antibonding orbital in this molecule remains empty. So this diagram here is called a molecular orbital, or MO, energy diagram. The antibonding orbital up here at the top is higher in energy or less stable than the bonding orbital down here at bottom. One thing you should know is that having electrons in the antibonding orbital is destabilizing. That is, it reduces the molecule's stability. If you get to the point where you have the same number of electrons in an anti-bonding orbital as you have in the bonding orbital, in other words, once the number of electrons up here in this box equals the number of electrons down here in this box, you've now completely destabilized the molecule, and that molecule would, in theory, be impossible to form. In theory, then, if we actually took a molecule of H2 and started bombarding with electrons, if you got to the point where you bombarded a single molecule of H2 with two electrons, those electrons would have to go into that molecule's antibonding orbital because the number of electrons in its antibonding orbital would now be the same or equal to the number of electrons in its bonding orbital. All of the stability conferred by the bonding electrons would be negated or canceled out by the destability conferred by the antibonding electrons, and that molecule would blow apart. 
We can see that typified in this hypothetical example, a molecule of helium with two individual atoms, so helium-2, I guess. Because each individual helium atom has two valence electrons, when each of them comes with its 1s atomic orbital to the table, we now have four total electrons to work with. In theory, as those two uh, atoms overlap to form the theoretical molecule of helium-2, it would form a bonding orbital down bottom and an antibonding orbital up top. It's now four electrons would have to fill up those orbitals from the bottom up. Two electrons in the bottom box and two electrons in the top. The stability conferred by the bonding electrons is negated completely by the destability caused by the antibonding electrons because the two boxes have the same number of electrons. Therefore, that molecule would blast apart. So that begs the question, according to this diagram, why does helium-2 not exist? Now I want to teach you guys how to draw an MO energy diagram. To draw a simple molecular orbital, or MO, energy diagram for a molecule comprised of two atoms from either columns one or two, you follow these steps. And by the way, if you're doing a molecular orbital energy diagram for molecules that have more than two atoms, or atoms that aren't in columns one or two of the periodic table, it gets a lot more complicated. So I'm going to just keep it down to these parameters for this class. Step one. Draw two boxes that represent the atomic s orbitals at the same energy level to the right and left of each other, like this. Step two, add arrows to each box going up or down to indicate the number of s valence electrons for each atom, like this. This would be a scenario where I had one valence electron for each of the atoms that were going to bond together, such as two individual hydrogen atoms. You could also use any other atoms in theory that have a single valence electron. Step three, add two more boxes in between the previous two, one above and one below, like this. The upper box represents your antibonding orbital, and the lower box is your bonding molecular orbital. Step four, add cute little lines like this. Remember that the higher the box, the higher in energy, and hence less stable that box is. You can see then that the bonding molecular orbital is lower in energy and therefore more stable than the individual atomic orbitals are. That provides an energetic incentive for this molecule to even form at all. Step five, fill in your in-between boxes, these molecular orbital boxes, with the same number of total electrons as you had from each of the combined atomic orbitals to start with. Make sure you fill in these in-between boxes from the bottom up. In this case, I've got a single electron from each of these hydrogen atoms. You add them together, that gives me two. So I fill up these orbitals from the bottom up. One, two. That is now a beautiful molecular orbital energy diagram for H2. You should remember, of course, that if you have the same number of electrons in your antibonding orbital as you have in your bonding orbital, then the molecule is too unstable to exist. That concludes this lecture. Please stay tuned to the next one in which I'll teach you about bonding order, crap face, and sci-fart. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.